Eight races down, five to go in the 2023 Fanatec GT World Challenge America powered by AWS season. And it starts here at Road America. This track is a fan of fans and competitors alike. A favorite for all who come here with a rich history dating to races held on the streets of the nearby village of Elkhart Lake, which hosted a fabulous parade earlier in the weekend. Racing shifted to this facility back in 1955, and many of the best have raced and won here today. Road America is once more ready to challenge North America's best. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Marine. Calvin Fish is alongside. We'll have DJ Clark reporting from the pits for us here today. And without further ado, let's go down to DJ for stories to watch in race one. Welcome to Road America, the National Park of Speed, a majestic road course located in the heart of Wisconsin. Now, while there hasn't been a layout change on this over four mile circuit in over 50 years, a recent repave does mean that drivers will have to refresh their memories a little bit and reacquaint themselves with the circuit before heading out on track. The battles are on for the Pro and Pro-Am classes, with RS1 and Racer's Edge making it a two-horse race in the Pro category. Meanwhile, in Pro-Am, it's old rivals of Wright Motorsports and CrowdStrike by Riley competing for top spot. Some familiar faces join the ranks of our Am class this week, with TR3 fielding a car in the class. They'll take the green flag along with the rest of our Pro-Am and Pro entries from right here in just a few minutes. This is Road America, America's National Park of Speed. Opened in 1955, it's a four-mile high-speed tour through the Wisconsin countryside. Now let's jump on board in our Fanatec track preview with Daniel Morad from TR3 Racing. I'm Daniel Morad, driver of the number nine TR3 Racing Mercedes AMG GT3. Coming up the hill, taking the stripe to start the lap. Just uh, getting a little bit of heat in the tires, very tricky here at Road America, coming up to turn one, hard on the brakes, you want to be off the brake, roll the, the speed into turn one, and you use all that extra runoff that's been laid down with this new surface. Coming into turn three, again, heavy on the brakes, but really focusing on a clean exit. The exit's key because you're going on to one of the longest straights on the circuit, just going through the gears, up through fourth, fifth, underneath the underneath the cheese bridge, which is uh, always nice. I always think about cheese when I pass underneath it. Coming up to turn five, big brake zone. You're top of fifth gear in the Mercedes, hard on the brakes, the biggest brake zone on the track. Down to second gear. Again, really good exit because you're going uphill into turn six over a blind crest. Tricky to get your braking right because the rear of the car is so light. If you brake too early, you get understeer. If you brake too late, you get oversteer. Coming through turn seven, Nearly flat out, really aggressive over the curb, using all the track, really, really tight on exit. Into turn eight, hard on the brakes, downhill, you want to take that inside curb and avoid the exit curb. It's very, very aggressive. It can easily take you off the track. Coming into the carousel, as much speed as you can carry without getting outside the groove. You want to be really tight and focus on a super good exit. We're here at one of the iconic corners in American motorsport, the kink at Road America. Daniel, what makes this such an intimidating corner? Well, coming up to the kink, it's so narrow, it feels like it's an inch wide. And if you get it wrong, there's huge consequences, so you have to get it right. Just take a look over our shoulder, and you'll see exactly what Daniel's talking about. After the high-speed run through Kettle Bottoms, we arrive here at Canada Corner. Who better than the Canadian Daniel Morad to tell us about this unique part of the racetrack? Yeah, I mean, this is a great passing opportunity. Huge brake zone. If you have a good run through the kink and you keep it pinned, which is very difficult, uh, you have a really great opportunity. Come up the inside. If you get offline here, there hasn't been any like maple syrup laid down. There is a lot online, though. Lots of grip on the groove, none off the groove. Off the corner, the curbs are really aggressive, so you don't want to use too much of it. Coming into 13, taking that curb on the inside, you have to be careful. You don't use too much track on the outside to get the car back over for 14. Final corner, turn 14, and it's a crucial one, Daniel, because it leads to this drag strip of a front straight. But not many drag strips have this much elevation. Yeah, I mean, just starting from the entry, it's so tricky to get it right because you're braking on the turn. So getting that line right and not going too wide over that limit is important. And just getting a clean run through a really poggers exit. You want to make sure you're on throttle early and getting maximum drive off to the start-finish line.
That was our Fanatec track preview. Big thanks to Daniel Morad for joining me for that high-speed tour around this wonderful racetrack here at Road America. Calvin Fish sits alongside. You've raced here before. What makes this play such a challenge? Well, it's a special vibe when you come to Road America, the racetrack itself, the village of Elkhart Lake. And it's a wonderful circuit to race on. It's very challenging. It's high speed, of course. Three really long straightaways with big, big brake zones. That creates overtaken opportunities. Uh, but then just the challenge of this new surface, you've got to throw away old notebooks, develop new ones. And uh, what surprise we saw here this morning in uh, qualifying with Conquest Racing. I've been struggling a little bit, quite honestly, with this Ferrari springing up to the top. Manny Franco, a brilliant lap. Yeah, they turned it all around in qualifying today. You're yeah. right, Manny Franco on the Rova pole here for race number one. One. His co-driver, Alessandro Balzan, was pretty quick as well, looking ahead to tomorrow's race number two. And that Ferrari team, they came in here with high hopes and were quickly humbled in practice. But great work by the Conquest Racing guys to get this car ready to go for qualifying. And now, great starting position for the race. Yeah, and I think that's really important to uh, control the race. Control the racing line, because if you go offline, as uh, Daniel Moore had alluded to, on the look at the racetrack, it is treacherous. And we've seen a lot of people come a cropper by doing that. So you've got to be online. Certainly, Manny can control the start of this race. But he's got a really feisty George Kurtz alongside him put together a last lap flyer put that crash right by Riley Mercedes on the front row here today and he's coming off a great GT America win just a short while ago today yeah the wind is in his sails that car has been the pace setting car for the bulk of our week in the build up to these races Colin Brown blitzed the field in qualifying for race number two the only driver to go sub 202 in qualifying, and that gives us some preview of the pace potential of that number zero for Mercedes. Yeah, it's going to be a great battle once we get the pros on board for the second phase of this race. Mandatory pit stop between the 40 and 50 minute mark. Uh, minimum pit stop time today is 86 seconds. You're going to be wanting to be tight to that. It's a long, long pit lane here. Cost you about 40 seconds if you do a stop under green, so you don't want to be doing that today with any damage or any penalties few new lineups and even a new car here in the field this weekend of note certainly the addition of Madison Snow to the Wright Motorsports stable he'll be sharing his Porsche with Jan Halen in the seat that Charlie Luck had held for the start of the season Charlie with some health issues we wish you a speedy recovery Charlie hope to see you back at the track again really soon but the arrival of Madison Snow means that car is now a pro class car and that will be something to keep an eye on. But it does seem that Wright Motorsports and the Porsches in general are looking for a little bit of performance. Yeah, with the new car, they haven't really found the sweet spot yet. Seems to struggle down the long straightaways here. That's really been its deficit this year. Uh, Handling-wise, they like it around this uh, four-mile circuit. As we take a quick look, 14 turns, very challenging. 171 feet of elevation change, Ryan. And we talk about the long straightaways here. There's three of them, up to turn one, down to turn five, and into Canada corner. And uh, you need top speed, but you need hand handling and braking ability as well. It's a real test of the balance of a race car. You need to have the straight line speed, but you have to have the handling for the tighter stuff as well. Down there on the grid, we heard from him at the top of the show. Let's check in one more time with DJ Clark. Thanks, Ryan. Cars are about ready to fire off here. And as you can see, the Porsche of Wright Motorsport, both of them lining up one, two there. The new driver change this week for Madison Snow coming on in to the 45. Going to be very, very interesting. They'll be starting alongside the DXDT Racing Mercedes here. It's going to be a dogfight. It looks like at this point it's kind of going to be all over the place. Lots of manufacturers up here in the top uh, 10 or so. Going to be very fun to see. Yeah, it's a good mix of cars throughout this field. Mercedes has the strength in numbers. You look at qualifying for race two, and it's a lot of Mercedes towards the front, but a bit more mixed up, as DJ alluded to here in race number one. And some fast cars towards the back of this field. Uh, we heard from Daniel Morad earlier. His co-driver, Ziad Gondor, did the qualifying earlier today. They're all the way at the back, and I'm really curious to see what they can do, particularly if there is a yellow in the second stint and Daniel gets to turn it loose. Yeah, that's what drivers like Daniel Morad are looking for for the second phase of that race. Get a compression of the field so they've not got such a time deficit to make up as well as positions. And uh, Daniel was very much at the sharp end for qualifying uh, for his uh, race start here tomorrow. So there's pace in that Mercedes. They need a little bit of help. And uh, we haven't seen a lot of yellows this year. We've talked about it a lot. But we haven't seen a lot of yellow flag action. But this racetrack, as we said, if you veer off line a little bit, you can go for rides. So today may be that little bit different. That has been the huge talking point throughout the paddock. The grip is there online. We're seeing new track records left and right at this track since the repave. But 
you venture off the racing line at your own peril. We'll keep an eye on that throughout the race, but keep in mind, this is only the second full course repave in Road America history, the first since 1995. So it, this is truly a journey into the unknown. I don't think there's anybody racing here in this race that would have been there for the previous surface before the one laid down in 1995. So I think for the first time, everyone in this field experiencing what this is all about here with this new pavement at Road America. Global points. Let's remember that Fanatec GT World Challenge is a global championship with continental series in Europe, United States, Asia, and Australia. Coming into the weekend, Mercedes AMG holds down the top spot, Porsche second, Audi in third. Those three manufacturers have been quite close throughout the season, starting to edge ahead of BMW, Ferrari, McLaren, and Lamborghini but cars from all the classes scoring points for the manufacturers. It's a coveted award that Mercedes has had the better of here in recent seasons, and they appear well poised to do something similar today here in Wisconsin. Speaking of Wisconsin, hometown hero Manny Franco starts on the pole position here today. George Kurtz, already a winner in GT America competition this morning, starts alongside. Eric Dilgaris on the pro class pole. He'll roll off in that, actually second in the pro class. He's the points leader in pro, rolls off third. Anthony Bartone, an impressive rookie in the fourth spot. Chandler Hall in a repaired car for Bimmer World after Bill Oberlin had a close escape in the kink in qualifying. Starts fifth, Seth Lucas alongside in the sixth spot from MDK Motorsports. Scott Smithson, DXDT Racing up in the seventh spot, and Adam Adelson in the previous generation. Porsche 911 starts eighth. Will Hardiman back after missing the round at VIR, ninth starting spot for him. And Madison Snow, his first race with Wright Motorsports in nearly a decade. Back to the next row where you find Samantha Tan of ST Racing and Ashton Harrison of Racer's Edge. Ashton and Mario Farnbacher swept the Pro-Am class wins here at Road America last year. Jeff Burton starts 13th. Derek DeBoer from TRG in 14th in that beautiful Aston Martin. Kyle Washington, he'll be joined by Jerome Bleekamolen here this weekend. He'll start 15th. And Paul Keebler, a debutante in the championship in the 16th spot. And finally, Ziad Gondor starting 17th. Let's head down to DJ Clark with Stephen McAleer. Down here on the grid with Stephen McAleer. Stephen, good starting position today. How are you feeling it's going to go? Uh, we're excited. We've got a little bit of help from the series there on some, uh, some weight taking off. So I think we'll be a little closer. Uh, I think they're just coming around the last corner to take the green here. So Eric starting third. We'll, we'll see if we can hang on today. It's going to be a, it's going to be a hot race. It is indeed. Back to you guys up there. Good to hear from Stephen McAleer. He and Eric Filgaris dominated the early portions of this season, Calvin, in the pro class. The first season of GT3 racing for Eric Filgaris. They've hit a tougher stretch as of late, but decent pace in qualifying. And with a couple minor tweaks to the balance of performance prior to this race, you heard from Stephen McAleer, he feels confident they can fight at the front. Yeah, those changes will take a little bit of edge off the Mercedes that's been pretty dominant here this weekend and give some back to some of the other competitors. But he talked about it being a hot race. These temperatures we're seeing at the race start time are the most extreme we've seen throughout the course of the weekend. That will change the grip in this racetrack, change the balance of these race cars. So a little bit of unknown territory that we're stepping into here. Great looking field of GT3 machinery. Getting ready for the first of two races of the weekend here at Road America. 90 minutes the distance, mandatory pit window right in the middle of this race for the Pro-Am lineups. It's the AMs that start here in race number one today. And a great field ready to take the green. Rova Pole Award winner Manny Franco in his first full season of GT3 racing leads this field up the hill into the VP acceleration zone. He's in the Ferrari on the left-hand side of the screen with George Kurt starting alongside. Great jump by the pole sitter, Manny Franco. He takes the green flag as the field roars down this long 4,400-foot front straightaway. Franco in the Ferrari. Kurtz now fighting Phil Garris for the second spot. He'll be able to consolidate it from the outside. Phil Garris fights now with Bartone side by side through turn number one. Bartone a little bit wide there. That may open up the door for Seth Lucas on the MD Key Motorsport Porsche. He has to give it up. Everyone's slotting in nicely. Nice and clean here on the opening lap so far. 
side by side through a tricky part of this racetrack, especially post repave to go to abreast, but the field makes it work. Franco, Kurtz, Vilgaris, the top three, then Bartone and Lucas. The fight though on for the sixth spot. Here comes Adelson up the inside of Chandler Hall, Porsche on BMW. Adelson takes it in nice and deep, really tight there on the inside. There's Madison Snow side by side with Ashton Harrison. A little bit of a crossover there on the climb up to turn six between the number 120 and the 94 machine. And the 94, that's the BMW back to the flank. It looked like momentarily of the Porsche, but that cost Chandler Hole a spot. Madison Snow was able to sneak on through. Here's a look from Seth Lucas to the inside of Bartone. A couple of neophytes to GT3 racing, but fighting at the pointy end here in GT World Challenge America. Really solid opening lap for our pole sitter, Manny Franco, controlled the start nicely, got the jump, has pulled about four to five car lengths here on George Kurtz. Looks like Phil Guerra's are looking a little bit feisty and racy there in position three. Into the kink for the first time. This is a gut check part of the track, especially if the tires aren't fully up to Tim. Had a few big moments there, including one for Bill Oberlin in qualifying two earlier this morning. He had a spin, backed it into the wall, managed to drive away, and then went on to set the fifth fastest time in the session. Call him Steve McQueen, the great escape on that one. That was simply amazing. Manny Franco holding the lead, coming around turn 14 for the first time. George Kurtz, though, starting to reel him back in, and Eric Filgaris flexing the muscle in the first of the Porsches, climbing the hill, Bartone and Adelson, and then the fight here with Madison Snow and Chandler Hole, who has dropped back quite a bit on this first lap. He has, there you see the muscle of that BMW down the straightaway, clears Madison quite easily, actually, by him and back in line. That showcases what that new Porsche is kind of fighting, even with the weight break that they got given before the start of this race. Franco's lead at the line, half a second over Kurtz. Those are the two leaders in their respective classes. Franco in pro, pro-am to George Kurtz. Kurtz right now in a sandwich between the top two cars in the pro class. He's not fighting for class position with either Franco or Phil Garris. Yeah, and he's got to keep that big picture thinking because they're very tight in the championship coming into this round. Only four points back, the 1-2-0 that sits there a little bit deeper in the field right now. Looked like in the background, Adelson was starting to take the fight down the inside of Anthony Bartone, heading down the hill to turn number five, and he's Gets got it. that pass. Well done. And he's having to make a transition from the GT America race where he's in the newer version of this Porsche versus this second generation car that he shares with uh, Elliott Skier here today. Bartone lost three spots there at the exit of five, not just to Adelson, but Hall and Snow also were able to get through. And now he has to quickly regather it because all of a sudden here comes Ashton Harrison starting to charge from her deep in the pack starting position. Yeah, she's had a really nice run, started in P12, now up to P8 early in the going. This is kind of the form that we expect to see from the Acura here this weekend. As you said, they swept both pro and class victories here last year. Plenty of side-by-side -side action here. Down through Kettle Bottoms into Canada Corner. Oh, nice move there. Lucas fighting with Harrison. Samantha Tan not too far back either in that brightly colored BMW. The biggest mover, by the way, on that first lap was Madison Snow up four positions overall to sixth after one lap. Yeah, you'd expect that. He had to be frustrated with that qualifying run. A lot of talk about what they might be able to do together. He and Jan Halen moving up to the pro category. Madison feeling the uh, seat of, filling the seat of Charlie Luck this weekend and probably for the rest of the season, it sounds like from a lot of drivers in the paddock. They think this BMW M4 is a rocket ship down the straights. We saw a whole blitz past Snow one lap ago, and he had designs on doing it again, but Adelson was just quick enough in a straight line. And keep in mind, this is the older generation Porsche 911. Maybe a little bit more slippery in a straight line. Well, I think that's what you're seeing there. He uh, skipped around Madison Snow pretty easily, but when he comes up against the older generation, that has a bit more straightaway speed. Not the same dynamic as you can see. He's not really making much ground there. Down at the brakes over turn five, Adelson takes it in nice and deep. What a marvel he's been with that transition up to GT3 machinery this year. Leads the championship right now, albeit by a slender margin, just four points over the CrowdStrike racing entry. And a tough weekend at VIR after sweeping the weekend at Circuit of the Americas back in May. Phil Garris is on back. the charge. Yeah. Fastest lap up to P2. 
This is the leader, Manny Franco, from nearby Milwaukee. But it's Vilgaris who has the crowd strike fastest lap of the race. Not by much, though. It was only 15 thousandths separating the top two the last time around. I think they'll be pretty happy with this. They didn't look great in practice yesterday, but once again, the RS1 team keeps dialing on the knobs and finding the sweet spot for that Porsche. And execution, as we saw last year on the way to a GT4 championship, this is right in their lane. What a season it was in Pirelli GT4 America last year. 11 wins, 12 podiums for this combination as we go safety car. I believe, here with just a couple laps in the books. We'll see if that is true or if that's just, oh, yep, something has happened at the exit of the kink. Ah, Will Hardeman has made left side impact. Clear suspension damage with the left front. He's able to drive away. Let's see if we get a look at it. Woo. Lost it early in the corner. Yes, he did. See, a lot of cars kind of understeer off when they get just outside that lane. That's what Auburn did initially, then lost the rear end, but Hardeman lost the rear end of that Mercedes very early at turn in. Oh, and just can't get it turned. That left front is all locked up. Hopefully he can keep it from getting stuck in the gravel trap and limp it back to the pit lane. Tough break for this S's racing team. Great addition to the paddock here this year. Hardeman shares this car with sports car veteran ex-open wheel champ, Adam Carroll. Don't think we're gonna get the chance to see Adam today. Race Vision powered by AWS. Fastest Sector 2 belongs to Eric Filgaris, who at the time was running down the leader, Manny Franco, who is second on that list. Then it's Adelson and Snow. A lot of Porsches excelling in that middle sector. Does that make sense to you, Cal? Well, there's a lot of turns there, so that's where the downforce of the new Porsche would come into play a little bit more than the straightaways that you're seeing in sector one as uh, two of the big straightaways uh, up to turn one and obviously down to turn five are incorporated into that first sector. Each of these cars, of course, will have their unique strengths and weaknesses based on the layout of the car, the engine configuration, turbo or naturally aspirated front or rear engine etc. And I thought it was really interesting in a published interview, Madison Snow, who drives a BMW in another championship and was just here a few weeks ago in that BMW. One. Yes. Was comparing and contrasting the driving experience going from the BMW M4 to this Porsche 911. And he said, there aren't too many similarities. No, very different with the weight distribution of the two cars respectively. So it's been an adaptation for him, but uh, I think he'll get it. I mean, he's just a quality driver, just come on leaps and bounds over the last handful of years. Multi-time champion. And uh, he and Jan Halen have a good chemistry. They know each other well, families have known each other for a long, long time. So they actually co-drove together back in 2015. That's right, that's right. It's a reunion of sorts for Madison Snow, whose parents were racers in their own right. They drove for Wright Motorsports back in the day. And Madison said, there are a lot of faces around this team that I recognize from my time, either with my parents or racing for Wright Motorsports myself. Once again, race vision powered by AWS Sector 2. Very Porsche dominated. Here with the early going, not even 10 minutes into this under full course yellow because of an incident involving Will Hardeman, who was able to limp back to the pits. Most places gained. Mentioned Madison Snow, but Adam Adelson now up another spot. So both of them plus four on the day. Ashton Harrison gaining three positions early in the going too. Derek DeBoer there, two positions up. He loves Road America. Great to see him back here with uh, Valentin Hasaklo. They've really uh, become great friends, and uh, they're having a lot of fun. They missed a session with some brake issues. Derek had quite a ride down in the Canada corner when he had the brakes go away uh, from him in the Thursday test sessions. They missed yesterday morning's practice, and that put them on the back foot a little bit. Otherwise, they could be a little bit further up the order, I feel. There's no good place to have your brakes go out, but going into Canada corner might be no, about the worst. It is. He skipped across the inside of the apex there, and... Uh, salvaged it somehow light brush not too much body damage fortunately good news the cleanup is complete the toyota gr supra safety car has pulled off and we head to the vp acceleration zone with manny franco in control it's an early restart he jumps on it watch how yep had a big head of steam there nowhere to go with it it's a narrow front straight for sure green flag waves 
Moving to the inside, George Kurtz trying to defend from Adam Adelson, who squeezes George down to the apex. They go side by side. Snow takes a peek up the inside of Hull. In the meanwhile, the MDK car of Lucas goes off and on track. Great recovery to keep from hitting anything. Yeah, really clean racing there with everyone. Great respect. I love to see that. That could have gone wrong so easily initially between Adelson and Kurtz in turn one. And then uh, Hull and Adelson down in turn three as well. Not done yet between Hull and Adelson. Adelson forced to guard the inside. We know the BMW is a rocket ship. It pulls alongside really tight between the two of them. Just not enough purchase there Snow's going to get him. And that opens the door for Madison Snow now. Yeah, that was really nice driving there by Madison. Just reading that situation. Chandler went for him. Just got in a little bit too deep. Couldn't get it rolled down. Scrambling for grip on the exit. Oh, oh, big moment. It's going to be a hit. Into the tire barrier, Adam Adelson. Championship big, big leader. Big, hits. Debris all over the racetrack. And a lot of dust as well. That looked like it was unsighted. Possibly for Keebler there. Great quick reaction to dodge the stranded vehicle. Safety car deployed already for the second time. We talked about it. We haven't seen a lot of safety cars uh, throughout the course of this championship season. But with this racetrack, so easy to step over the mark that you see just gets wise through turn seven pinched it a little bit couldn't afford to give the car its head any further thought he's going to get way out in the grass and that just threw him across the road and then this right there you can yeah. tell just how big of a dust cloud that was by the fact that keebler was so late in reacting i don't think he had any notion that there was a car sitting there because of all the dust this could be huge in the championship in the program ranks the 120 car had a four point lead coming in they also had issues where Elliott Skier didn't even make a qualifying run for race two here tomorrow. So in the wars big time, could be a big swing with the 0-4 car running so well this weekend. Well, that's a great point for sure. However, this is I think the first weekend they've ever had two chassis on site. He has been running this car in both GT America and Fanatec GT all season. They have the new 992 spec car that Adam ran this morning in GT America. So if the damage is significant, I wonder if they can't press that car into service and at least have a chance to salvage something. And there is Adam climbing out of the car. He's all right, but he'll survey the damage. Doesn't look that bad. I mean, I know the rear clip has been torn off, but if you look underneath that, everything else looks to be reasonably intact but you never can tell and only take a pickup point or something be ripped out of the chassis and that could change the complexion of possibility of getting it back together yeah but again if there is a silver lining this is the first weekend they've had a backup car they could go to if take necessary a look there, just a little bit wide then looks like he pinched it then comes across unfortunately for him gets into the tire barrier versus a little bit deeper and further Correct. down the road where you'd be into the the concrete so left front took a pretty sizable hit too that's Probably three corners on that car that are going to need a close look and significant repairs. Great to see Adams all right. Well, that's a real mistake I've seen him make this year, to be honest with you. Absolutely. He has been a revelation. But as we've talked about, this track this weekend has bit some of the most experienced drivers in the field. James Sofronis in testing, who's been racing here since the mid-90s. Had an off, hurt his back. He's not racing here this weekend. We saw Bill Oberlin in qualifying get away with one in the kink. These are two of the most experienced drivers in any paddock. As we look at a race vision powered by AWS and the competitive overtakes, Madison Snow, he's been a busy boy. Yep, I mean, uh, certainly got the experience uh, amongst the uh, starting drivers here to make moves like this, coming off a disappointing qualifying run here this morning. We talked about the slight BOP changes with some weight changes amongst the top competitors. Mercedes re re uh, received a little bit of weight on their cars. Everyone else lost some other than the Ferrari that stayed the same. And it doesn't take much, it's just a little nuance there and that can get you in at the sweet spot. Average speed here overall in our race vision powered by AWS. This perhaps somewhat affected by our safety cars, but Will Hardeman, 94.7. That's under safety car speeds, I believe. Be on last lap versus the highest mm -hmm. lap speed that we're seeing here today. Top speed here at a GT3 car, Cal? Top
top speed. Uh, you're about 165 to 168, I would say. Um, that's achieved just before Canada Corner, but down at turn five, up into turn one, similar within a couple of miles an hour. And turn five, the slowest corner on the track, or close to it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's a second gear corner. Minimum speed, probably about 60 miles an hour. So bleeding off about 100 miles yeah. an hour, just a few hundred feet, right? That's what makes it fun. That's what makes it so, uh, you know, there's opportunity there to make some moves if you're willing to risk under braking, keep it together. Tough brake zone two, big downhill plunge there at turn five. The track kind of falls away a little bit as you approach the apex as well. But a great overtaking opportunity if you've got a car that's set up for it. See a lot of action down there at the end of the Moraine sweep at turn five. Speaking of top speeds, hey, you were pretty spot on there. How about Samantha Tan checking in at 167, Chandler Hull 165. That confirms what our eyes were telling us, that BMW in a straight line can haul. There was Samantha sharing the car once again with Neil Verhagen, who debuted with the team at VIR to great effect, really solid weekend they had together there. She's running ninth right now, but fourth in the Pro-Am class, right on the rear wing of Smithson. Let's watch from on board with Madison Snow as the team car goes around right in front of him. Yeah, saw a little twitch there as I think he was just outside that line. We keep talking about where the rubber has been laid down. There's grip if you get outside that. It's quite a difference. I mean, you're always going to have that to a certain degree on any race, race circuit right now with what I'd call the greenness of this new surface. You get outside there, it's like being on ice and then a little twitch there, a little bit of overcorrection. Hour and 12 minutes to go. And now a chance since we're behind the safety car to take a little peek behind the curtain at how the technical staff works here as part of SRO Motorsports America. My name is Joe Legan. I'm technical manager here for SRO America. At every event, the technical team sets up skill pads for each series. So GT World Challenge, GT4, Touring Car America, and also the GR Cup. During the test day and practice days, the teams and competitors have the opportunity to bring their car by to verify their compliance with the rules and also with the limits that we've placed upon the cars for balance reasons. So after the sessions where you can win something, so whether it be a pole award for qualifying or the podium for the race one, race two, uh, we bring cars of interest and the podium cars across the scales again to re-verify that they were in compliance. And so we'll look at weight, ride height, we'll look at camber of the wheels and tires, we'll look at other physical um, elements of the car. We do also have data scrutineers that extract the data from the onboard data recorder and inspect it for the performance of the car exhibited on track to make sure it was still within the limits placed upon the car. One avenue to getting into working in tech here at SRO America is through our college internship program. For every event, we recruit local college students from any engineering discipline to come out and participate with our officials as assistants. They get hands-on with the cars, hands-on with the tooling, and they really become a part of the process. Great insight there into how the technical staff works in SRO America. Impressive uh, what they have to do every weekend from a logistical perspective, and we could not do it without them. So thank you to Joe and that entire team. Continuing under our second safety car of the race, let's go ahead and take this chance to check back in pit side with DJ. Thanks, Ryan. I'm down here with Bill Oberlin from the Bimmer World team. And Bill, we were just talking. Straight line speed, a big, big gain for you guys in the BMW this weekend. Could be playing to your advantage. Could be, especially with all these restarts. I told Chandler, hey, suck up right on their bumper on these restarts, and hopefully you can uh, get get the draft going and then slingshot engaged and go right on by. And that's kind of our a little bit of our tactic. Another thing is the Bimmer World guys have set this car up really well. It handles the best it's ever handled. And we have good straight line speed, so we're just going to try to climb our way to the front so we get to the, to the top step. So, I mean, that's the plan. Obviously, going offline here, down through the hurry down is a little bit sketchy. Is it just all about straight line speed? No, no, no. I mean, uh, I've done 
I was here a couple of weeks ago and made some pass on the outside going into one, and you sort of over under somebody. They get a little in too deep. They cross the line. They get into the marbles a little bit on the outside, and you can make some of these things stick. But believe me, straight line speed is your best friend here. If you can, if you can suck right up on somebody and draft them and go by, that's the easiest pass you're going to make all day. Well, there it is from Bill Oberlin. Drafting's the name of the game here. A shiver of fear just went down the spines of the paddock to hear Bill Oberlin say the car is fast in a straight line and it handles as well as it has all season. Yeah, it's tough to come up with that combination, right, because you kind of trade off one for the other in terms of downforce and drag. But uh, BMW is strong here. They sit in P5 right now. I think that's where Bill qualified for the race tomorrow as well. So they're at the sharp end. Uh, they'd love to get another victory. And uh, they've been knocking on the door, and uh, they really found the sweet spot with the setup, as Bill said. I spoke to him yesterday morning. He's really happy, and uh, he's one of those guys who just keeps tinkering. He keeps working with the crew, really grinding on everyone to get the maximum out of a race car every single weekend. And uh, they're looking in good shape here. I think they've got a couple of really strong runs, potentially good results. Fourth in points, but only 37 points out. It's really tight in the Pro-Am ranks, and so they're very much in the mix here at this stage with just including this race, four regular distance races remaining, plus the Indy 8 hour. And keep in mind, I think Bill Oberlin is undefeated when he has turned up yes, to the Indy right. 8 hour. Some of that's been in GT4, GT4 yeah. but they did win the American portion of that race in GT3 last year. Look at the best laps of the day. We talked about it earlier. Eric Filgaris just pivoted Manny Franco to that top spot, and you can see big margin, almost a second over the rest of this field. So they're kind of the dominant cars right now with the drivers that are currently on board. I expect to see some of that shift around once we get the pros on board for the second phase of this race. I'd also like to see what Chandler Hall can do without traffic to deal with. I suspect that BMW is going to be pretty strong, and he set that third fastest time fighting with others in the mid-pack. So that uh, bodes well for the Bimmer World Bunch right now running in the fifth spot. Yeah, and you'd have to think with Madison Snow, he looked vulnerable earlier, so on this restart, when we eventually get there, you think if Chandler can time it, he might be able to get a run up into turn one on the 45 car, maybe make an early move here. Let's talk pit strategy here, Calvin, because we're approaching that pit window. It's not far away now. How do these yellows affect, or do they, the way these teams are going to play this? The yellows are going to affect too much. I mean, typically you want to get your pro in early. Uh, always a factor here at Road America in years past was the tire degradation factor in terms of if you get the pro in too early, make that big 50-minute stint. Do they have any tires left at the end of that? But with the smoothness of this surface, we're not really hearing the teams talk about that this year. So I think the tires aren't uh, going off as much. I think as the fuel load gets lighter, the cars are actually getting quicker. We saw that a little bit in qualifying this morning as well. So that can change your, your outlook on how you want to slice the cake, so to speak. That window due to open now in 16 minutes and 30 seconds and will remain open for 10 minutes. And that full service stop must be made inside of that window. Good news is the cleanup is complete and it looks like we're set for another restart. Manny Franco looked awfully strong on the previous restart and he leads the field again into the VP acceleration zone and up the hill under the bridge looking for the green flag at start finish in hot pursuit that's where you'll find Eric Filgaris George Kurtz looking a little bit vulnerable though here comes Madison Snow and also Chandler Hall on the prowl in that BMW yeah I think Madison Snow there was using the uh, draft effect of George Kurtz a little bit to try and protect from the uh, BMW that was coming at him pretty quickly there but had nowhere to go with it had to go around the out outside so really heads up driving there by Madison Snow once again and uh, the top two kind of leapt off uh, turn 14 and created a little bit of a gap back to George Kurtz who continues to lead the Pro-Am ranks Bartona second in Pro-Am only sitting six on the road Hole got around Snow in that run down to turn number five it's Franco, Filgaris, Kurtz and now Hole seems like he and Madison Snow have swapped that spot three or four times, like a couple of fencers with a thrust and a parry. And right now, the edge goes to Chandler Hall. Ashton Harrison, she's having an excellent run. Has got Ryan Bartona. is now up to P6 overall. Great job from Ashton Harrison. That was not for class position, but it brings her now into the rest of the pro fight. And that sets the table nicely for Mario Farnbacher when he takes over.
Well, that's exactly what Mario was hoping for. You get the compression in the field with these safety cars, so the, the time deficit, forget the position, it's all about the time deficit you have to work with as well to the front of the field. Look at race car from the Racer's Edge team based down in Florida. They were here racing in the interest a couple of weeks ago. With an alternate strategy, had a shot to win that race. Came up a little bit short on the roll of the dice. Yeah, they were expecting a yellow and didn't see one right when they needed one, so I dropped them back to a P8 finish, I think, but definitely a podium, if not better, was on the cards for Mario, who was behind the wheel at the time. Looking on eagerly, they know how important this race weekend is. 28 cars having a solid day, the team that they're chasing in the championship. Ashton Harrison, last year so impressive in round two, the Pro-Am Championship. They kept the team together, just made the jump up to Pro from Pro-Am. And they feel like they fit right in, running second in the points as they run. 16 tallies out of the lead, now starting to catch Madison Snow in a battle for fifth overall, but fourth in class. Ashton's having a really solid run here. I think uh, this will give her a lot of inspiration or have the start to this race. Young lady who really does it right, really takes it super serious. As does Samantha Tan as well, another female driver in our field, of course. They've both come on so strongly over the last couple of seasons. She had the fastest lap of the race in class in this race one year ago when they were a pro and class car. Again, they swept the two races here last year in class. That car, that team, Certainly right at home, racing here at Road America. Manny Franco's lead, six tenths of a second over Eric Filgaris. Manny has been spot on on these restarts and the initial start as well. He claimed the Rova Pole Award for the first time this season. Through the carousel and through and into the kink, we look at Manny Franco, Eric Filgaris, third place to George Kurtz, Chandler Hall, Madison Snow, Ashton Harrison, then it's Barton, Samantha Tan. Behind Samantha runs Scott Smithson, Derek DeBoer, with Jeff Burton giving chase. And on and on they go to TR3 Mercedes towards the back of the pack. Waiting to see one of them at least come to life in the second half of this race when Daniel Morad gets his turn. But the fight for the lead heats up now into turn 14. Yeah, Manny Franco's done an excellent job. Hasn't put a foot wrong, but Eric Filgaris, as we said, has the fastest lap of this race by just a few hundreds, but is keeping the pressure on Manny Franco. He'd love to be able to hand this car over to Stephen McAuley with the lead of this race. Chopped off another tenth of a second. Did Eric Filgaris? George Kurtz, though, just turned in the crowd strike fastest lap of the race at 206.619. That's about a tenth of a second quicker than Franco, right there on pace with Phil Garris. So the third placed car, the leader in the Pro-Am class, keeping pace with the top two. This is exactly like cut and paste to what we saw in the GT America race earlier today, where George Kurtz's car just came alive midway through his stint. Vision powered by AWS. You see Eric Filgaris with the fastest time through the second sector. He's also got the quickest time in sector three, as you're about to see. And Porsche very strong in the second two thirds of the lap. Hull is the right there Arion. with Kurt, so uh, Hull's got some pace as well. His fastest lap was only a tenth off of Chandler Hull, so these cars are getting quicker and quicker. We talked about the tire degradation not being such a factor here. As you get deeper into the stin, the car is getting lighter as it burns through the fuel load, and a lighter race car is quicker. And that's what we're seeing, that the Pirelli tire is standing up to the challenges here and just giving the drivers more and more performance. Just over 10 minutes away from the pit window opening up. Most of these teams will likely elect to go pretty deep into that window. Fingertips through the king. You think you want to be ripping the wheel for everything. It's worth someone dropped a little. Wheel there, maybe an Ashton there getting wide there through the kink in the red Acura in the backdrop there. Oh, geez, I got that backwards. We expect the Pro-Am cars in fairly soon. And again, as we've been talking about, these BMWs on the three long straightaways here at Road America letting their legs stretch somewhat. Samantha Tan with the fastest top speed, 167 miles an hour. 
Yeah, that gets your attention because a lot of these corners on the wind up to that are about 140, 150 through the kink. So that's why it's so uh, critical to uh, have it exactly on line as Manny Franco now sets the new fastest lap at a 206.5. So there is pace in that Ferrari that continues to lead. Remarkable. Great job to answer back by the Ferrari driver, Manny Franco. The lead now back to seven tenths. He ran just about a tenth quicker than both Phil Garris and Kurtz the last time by. Chandler Hole right there matching the top three for pace. Running in the slipstream of George Kurtz. Under an hour to go. Here's the battle for 10th, 11th, and 12th. Derek DeBoer leading this freight train. Jeff Burton and Seth Lucas, who's recovering from his wild off in the run from turn one to turn three at the early stages of this race. And Lucas is hunting now, moving to the inside of Jeff Burton. Two cars in different classes. Pro-class car of Lucas coming through on Jeff, but Jeff keeps it Pretty tidy around the outside, and this fight's not done yet, heading up the hill. Yeah, just gonna have to give that one up as Seth slides it down to the inside and uh, keeps that position. Great rhythm through this section. I think with the repaving, it's actually made it a little bit more seamless where you run through the curbing on the exit. It's almost like just an extension of the racetrack, even though the grip level may be slightly different. Chandler is keeping George Kurtz honest here, even though it's not a battle for class position. Oh, little twitch there by Chandler. That's right where his teammate Bill Oblin had a big moment in qualifying earlier this morning. Now let's think about this from a strategy perspective for Chandler Hall here. He's in a pro-class car, a pro-am car ahead of him. The am is in at the moment. That's the man who's about to take over for George Kurtz, Colin Brown, who has been as quick as anyone here this weekend. Chandler Hall's got to be thinking, if we're going to get to Franco and Phil Garris in the second stint, once the driver changes happen, of course, we probably need to get around that Mercedes now because it's not going to be easy for Bill to get by Colin in the second stint. No, it really isn't, but, you know, maybe you just go along with Colin for the ride if they line up as they do right now. Maybe catch uh, the 21 and 28 machine, respectively. You'll have Balzan and Stephen McAleer on board for the second half of this race. Franco just up the ante again. Ran a 2.06.2, new CrowdStrike fastest lap of the race. Eric Vilgaris checked in only six hundredths of a second shy of Franco's time. Yeah, they're gapping the field a little bit. Yep. Great job by Manny. Uh, seems to be getting stronger. Just a remarkable poise for a driver that does not have a ton of experience. Admittedly, he's kind of fast-tracked things with the amount of racing that he's done over the last couple of seasons. To be running at this level out front without making a mistake is uh, really a testimony to his natural uh, ability. And I think Franco's got a pretty good outlook on racing this season. I asked him about his expectations a few races ago, and he said, look, I've been off a lot here. I'm very new to this. I have zero expectations for the first couple years of this. I think by year three, that's when I'm going to expect to be fighting towards the front. And he's doing a really good job of onboarding as much information he can from his very experienced co-driver, Alessandro Balzan. And uh, Balzan is just a real ace. Uh, Three-time GT champion here in North America. Just great quality guy uh, just thinks about the big picture it's all about Manny's program and accelerating his learning process there he is he's getting ready now so you get close to that window you're going to start to get kitted up just in case there's a yellow or something you want to dive in uh, but he'll be ready to go short in stature but not short in talent that is for sure definitely great to have him back on a full-time basis he had to sit out from racing for a little while with some health issues Fully recovered now, and still has the speed and as clean of a driver as you will find. He is, he really, a great point. I mean, he races hard, but he races extremely clean. But a great team with Conquest ra Racing led by an ex-racer himself, Eric Bachelard. Very busy uh, team. They run multiple cars in Ferrari Challenge as well as their entries here in Fanatec GT and uh, Pirelli GT4. Franco has built his lead up to a second. We now find this battle. Seth Lucas continuing his recovery drive. Took a beat to the inside of Derek DeBoer, but 
wasn't close enough to make the lunge up the inside. This right here is the fight for the 10th spot overall. Yeah, Derek DeBoer loves coming back to Road America. They've still got Trace 3 on board. We've got new support from uh, Cadillac of Medford. So you've got Cadillac support on an Aston Martin. <laughs> Not sure he pulled that one off, but congratulations. Uh, they certainly do a lot for their partners there at TRG to make their programs happen. And a Chevy dealership on Anthony Bartone's Mercedes earlier in the season, too. That was a head scratcher, but apparently it's not without precedent. Derek wanted to give mention and thoughts. Uh, they have strong connections to uh, Maui, so uh, the horrible uh, situation over there in the past week or so. So their thoughts are with them as well at this time. No doubt about it. DeBoer currently, though, under a great deal of pressure from Lucas, who's flashing those headlights, takes a look up the inside, and Derek doing what he needs to do to keep that Porsche at bay. And look, this isn't for class position, but he wants a buffer to try and keep Jeff Burton at arm's length. Yeah, Burton isn't afraid to go racing, so uh, he starts moving around and trying to set up Derek DeBoer. Burton will take the opportunity to maybe fill a gap somewhere here. Lucas, another one of these drivers that has made the jump to GT3 without a ton of racing experience. Very, very limited. He was very impressive at the Indy 8 hour last year, winning the AM class. Oof. Tight stuff, nip and tuck as he continues to dog Derek DeBoer. He's but not quite close enough. He's in that kind of no man's land he wants to go for, but recognizes it's going to be super risky. But he's also, by sitting there and waiting, he's given Jeff Burton <laughs> the opportunity to lick his chops and think about having a go. We're about two laps away from the pit window opening up. Franco just reset the fastest lap of the race. The first driver to go sub 206 today and the lead is now nearly a second and a half. Here's Smithson fighting with Bartone. This is back for eighth and ninth overall. This is third and fourth in the Pro-Am class though. Bartone had a really strong qualifying run. He's backed up here a little bit in the race, but had a solid GT America run earlier today. Good solid weekend. And uh, good to see DXDT keep tweaking on these Mercedes. They seem to be getting more competitive. I know it's frustrating at times when they see the pace of the crowd strike by Riley effort, but there's no give up in that operation. And the run down to five as well as up the hill to six. Just before the break zone, you saw the Brake lights on Bartone flash just so briefly. Is that about resetting the pads? Yeah, sometimes if you run over the curbs here, it kind of rattles the rotor around and can get a little bit of what we call kickback on the pads. So when you go at the brakes the next time, there's a lot more travel. So sometimes you'll just left foot brake and uh, bring the pressure back up and get the uh, pads reseated on the rotor for when you hit the brake pedal. Great scrap here between a couple of really stout teams. Real-time racing, running the Bartone Brothers racing operation this year. And DXDT, no expense spared for DXDT. They have invested heavily. In the last few rounds, they're starting to see some speed as Smithson tried to make the outside work in Canada corner. Don't see that move made too often. Well, I think the reason for that was Bartone had got so defensive on the inside of Canada corner, he had nowhere to go. So this is really compromising their lap time by Anthony being super horny, loses a little bit there. So I think the balance has gone away on that real-time racing uh, Mercedes there. Seems like Bartone is struggling for grip here late in the going. Now, the good news is he will be able to pit the next time by if that's the strategy call they would like to make. Smithson up to eighth now overall and the final step of the podium. In the meantime, Seth Lucas finally got the job done on Derek DeBoer with a late lunge down into Canada corner. Yeah, just a little bit closer that time. And you feel it as a driver. You know that, okay, this is a go versus that, oh, that gray area, like this is super risky. And the other problem you have, Ron, when you're making these moves, you're offline and the grip level is not the same from the driver that you're attempting to overtake who remains on the racing line. So that's got to be factored in as well versus previous years here. A little battle breaking out between Ashton Harrison and Samantha Tan. That's for sixth and seventh. Samantha just turned her fastest lap of the race. At a 2.06.5, that's only a second off of what Manny Franco, the leader, ran the last time by. Ooh, Bartone dropped a couple wheels there at the exit of five, but was able to corral it. And here's Samantha running down Ashton. Yeah, 
car has come alive. So I'm really curious to see what Verhagen can do behind the wheel of the 38 and what Orbelin can do behind the wheel of the 94 car that he'll take over from Chandler Hull with the Bimmer World entry. Agreed. Neil Verhagen, even though he's an American driver, really hadn't seen him race a whole lot stateside until he showed up at VIR back in June. And he was so strong on debut. At the time, it was really just a one weekend deal, but ST Racing liked what they saw, snapped him up. Hope we see him in this race car for the foreseeable future. Great to have him back in the States. Yeah, bright young talent. Certainly uh, BMW picked up a good one there. Or inside that pit window, who will blink first? Who will make the call to the pit lane? You'll see some action. You can see oh, already yeah. happening up ahead. Everyone is in. Franco, Phil Garris, Kurtz, and Hull all making the trip into the pit lane. Well, again, the pros are going to be jumping on board the uh, Pro-Am entries here, so you want to get their speed and uh, use it as quickly as you can. 86 seconds from in to out, including service. That's what you're looking for. Very fine margins here. That's an aggressive time. If you hit that right, you have done a very solid pit stop. But you can see just how long this pit lane is. It's a crawl to your pit stop. Here we go. Franco is in, climbing out of that race car, and Alessandro Balzan getting set to jump in for the second stint. Fresh for LEP zeros and VP fuel into these race cars. Now the RS1 team springing into action. Margins are going to be fine here. How tight do you want to cut it? Fuel going to the front, of course, on the rear engine Porsche. We wait for the engine to refire. Conquest holding balls on. That's usually a good sign of a clean stop. And he's down and away. Now we wait to see how does he come out relative to the RS1 Porsche. He's ahead. Oh, Conquest did a great job. RS1. RS1. Right yep. For McAleer. Kurt's able to beat Hull out, and look at what Wright did. Wow. Wow. Jan Halen ends up in front of Oberlin there. Look at him go on the attack oh, immediately. Yeah. Cold tire performance. They're coming out of the tire warmers, but nonetheless, they're not exactly where they need to be. So this is where the experience can show in terms of wrestling these cars a little bit on these opening corners. But look at Balzan. He is way down the road. We hope that he's not shy of his uh, minimum stop time with that advantage. As it stands, a phenomenal bit of execution from Conquest Racing in the pits to consolidate that lead and actually to see it grow here in the pit stop window. Balzan scampering away. McAleer now running in second, but coming under some heat. Colin Brown, the leading Pro-Am car, the zero for Mercedes right there, center of the screen on the charge. So everyone's electing to get their faster driver in. I think a lot of that is because of these uh, tires here on this circuit. Not a lot of tire degradation. So even though it's going to be a, a long, long stint for these drivers, we haven't seen any fall off in performance from the Pirellis here this weekend, which is excellent. Allows these guys to go immediately on the attack. Colin Brown behind the wheel of the crowd strike entry. He's been the man to beat in terms of pace all weekend long. Blisteringly quick in Q2 earlier this morning to take the pole for tomorrow's race. The only driver to go sub 2.02 in qualifying. Oh, there whistling through the peak on relatively cold tires. He has to be thinking a little bit about what happened uh, earlier today. Even with his experience, it had to be in the back of his mind somewhere. Got about as lucky as anyone can hope if you have a spin in the kink to be able to drive away and continue your qualifying session and line up fifth for tomorrow. I've seen it surprise me to see the car right off and he continued to drive and uh, laid down fast laps to finish out the session. Just crazy. Mm. The fight there between Racer's Edge and ST Racing continuing, but now it's with Mario Farnbacher and Neil Verhagen. Here at comes the Colin Brown. Oh, gets yeah. a run on McAleer, looks to the inside. Does he force the issue? No. And that's prudent because this is not for class position. This does not affect his championship. And Colin, his closest pursuer in class is Neil Verhagen down in seventh overall. Yeah, so 
but the overall win is that little bit sweeter, right? And you can see that Ferrari kind of scampering away in almost five seconds down the road. So if he's got thoughts of an overall win, he needs to clear McLean relatively quickly. They've done it three times this season as a Pro-Am lineup, but never in the first race of the weekend. Pretty evenly matched there between uh, the Porsche and the Mercedes on the straightaway. But now up on the wheel. That could be a feisty little battle between he and Jan Halen, two of the most experienced drivers in this field. And shaping up right behind the McAleer Brown battle. That was Balzon coming through from the lead here through the carousel. Now, this is the fight for second and third overall, and just behind fourth and fifth are Halen and Oberlin. Brown there, a little bit wider the line there, so I'm not sure if he's picking up any area of aero flex from the Porsche in front of him through that long duration corner. Just takes a little bit of the downforce off the nose of the car and washes it out wide. This could be a great battle as well. Super Mario Farnbacher going up against Neil Verhagen. Let's take a look here. Neil Verhagen around Farnbacher. Wow. They can move like that on the exit of seven and clear him by the break zone for eight. Now Mario was not fighting Neil for class position. So perhaps he didn't want to fight too hard, but look at the fast times that are going to start pouring in. Balls on just did a 204.9. McAleer there in second, a 206 flat. Here we go, Bill Oberlin in that BMW again, blitzing around the outside of the right motorsports. Porsche to grab that spot away. That is for fourth overall and third in class. Yeah, we saw his teammate Chandler Hahn do a similar thing to Madison Snow when he was aboard the 45, so nothing that Jan Haling can do. It's frustrating when you got a car that's got good lap time potential, but uh, that's the edge that the BMW has now. He's making a move on Colin Brown here. He is on the go. We heard from Bill before his stint. He said, this car is a rocket ship in a straight line, and we got it handling better than we have all season long. He just made two moves in half a lap. Yeah, really super impressive. Balzan has a healthy lead, so he's got to go chase him. Right now, he sits in P3 overall and P3 in pro class as well, so he's going to keep attacking here. Top speeds, still all BMW, 167, 165. I think that was set back in the opening stint, but I'm excited to see what Bill can do as the fuel load starts to come down, especially since the tire wear has been minimal here this weekend. Well, Ashton Harrison had a great opening stint. Let's have a chance now to hear from her with DJ Clark. Down here with Ashton Harrison, as they said on the broadcast, put the car in exactly the position you guys need to. How was that first stint? That was a wild stint. You know, uh, Road America being over four miles, everyone thinks there's plenty of time, but really it's so fast. You have to be very specific when you make a pass. So uh, risk versus reward at a track like this, you know, it varies. But, I, you know, I knew what my job was. We didn't have a great qualifying, and my whole goal was to let it come to me and then make an aggressive move, move when it was ready. And uh, I really capitalized on that start. Yeah, you certainly did, and the multiple, multiple restarts. Does that throw you off as a driver a little bit, having to kind of reset on those uh, safety car periods? Um, no, I actually, uh, you know, and when, when the position I'm in today, I enjoy when we get a restart, but for me, it's whenever we're out of class cars are nearby and they're in front by some chance, and just letting them know, you know, I'm going to get by, so we can, you know, go side by side, or I can just dive because I need to get to the car ahead in front of you, and so luckily they're, they're pretty conscious, but that's really the only trouble when we do restarts. Well, there you have it. Mario Farnbacher in the car right now. Currently running in the seventh spot. Did get a message, by the way, that might explain why it was so easy. We'll talk about that in a second. Here comes Oberlin again on the prowl. Moves to the outside of McAleer. This is for second, not just overall, but also in class. McAleer really late on the brakes. Oh, this That's is going to be close. Coming up the hill to turn number six. Tough place to go side by side. Oberlin down the inside. He's got the position for now, but McAleer fights back to the outside. That was beautifully done there. Had the run on McAleer. McAleer took it in deep, and Oberlin just timed that crossover to perfection. Moves up to P2 in pro, in pro and overall. But we just saw a message that the move, the 
what we saw from Verhagen on the 93 car may have been that there's a crossover in the pit lane exchange and he was instructed by the officials to give that up and also the 94 got the nod that he could move in front of the 04 and the 45. I don't think Jan Halen got that message. He had to fight for that position. But I think Colin Brown had to wait for the other one and let him go. Basically, if you have overlap in pit lane during that pit stop exchange, you have to give it up. And some of the drivers didn't do that before. It does explain a little bit of the ease at which we saw the BMWs make the overtake. But then again, I don't think there was any help there trying no. to get around McAleer. And you can see just how stout that BMW is as Oberlin now sets off in pursuit of the race leader, Alessandro Balzon. One other piece of news to pass along, penalty for the TR3 Mercedes of Daniel Morad, a pit speed violation and that means a drive-through penalty for that car. Now back up at this look. Look here once again at this battle for the second spot as Oberlin fights with McAleer. Yeah, that run there is kind of a kink in the road and McAleer tried to use that to his advantage to defend, but Oberlin just timed it to perfection. Now Colin Brown is back on the march here again, so maybe he had to wait for Oberlin before he could get going here to give that position up. And now he's charging back towards the front, still leads in Pro-Am. 39 minutes to go. Balzon's lead over Oberlin, 6.7 seconds. The Bill Oberlin carved away five tenths on that last lap. Still plenty of time for the BMW Ace. Oberlin has the fastest lap of the race at 204.7, but Balzan has also run at 204.9, so there's not a huge delta between the two cars. Now Balzano has got to try and manage that 6.7 second gap, but there's still 38 minutes to go in this race. Plenty of time if Oblin maintains that delta to maybe catch this Ferrari. This is the race leader, Alessandro Balzano, the Italian, behind the wheel of a prancing horse as he's fitting. Through the carousel there, leading the way, but Bill Oberlin starting to close him down. He has certainly driven away from McAleer. McAleer's got his hands full with Brown. Neil Verhagen is starting to charge as well. Competitive overtakes. Yeah, that 38 car has been on the move in this race. It's not just positions gained, by the way. That is overtakes at different points in the race. So you might lose a position. You might gain it back. That second pass then would count towards this total. And it does not count pit stop overtakes either. This is all battles on the track. And Samantha Tan's the driver that got it all started for ST Racing here today. Oh, a little twitch there at the yeah. exit of turn 13. That's a tricky corner, Billy Mitchell. There used to be a bridge there mm -hmm. made it even more difficult, kind of uh, made you unsighted as you look for the apex through there. But even so, use all of that access road as well to uh, finish off the corner. But really one of those corners that you can exceed <laughs> the uh, grip that it wants to give you and go for a ride big time. Checking the gap first to second. Balls on, ran a 206 flat. Oberlin a 204.7. Wow. Chopping off lap delta. time. Bill Oberlin is on the march here. Can he maintain that pace? He's hoping that we talked about that these tires are staying underneath these race cars here, but even so an individual team can uh, go for some tire pressures that are going to give you that energy and that performance early and then it'll backtrack a little bit later in the run. Can he maintain this sort of pace? Another penalty handed down from race control. You see it on the screen there. Scott Smithson started the 08. Brian Sellers though will be the one who has to serve this drive through penalty for a pit speed violation. Sellers was ninth. He's ninth. Here's Morad serving his penalty right now. This hurts at this racetrack. It's about a 40 second drive through penalty in terms of staying on the racetrack. Green flag racing. That is a huge amount of time to lose. Third of a lap essentially. Tough luck for the Canadian Daniel Morad. Coming off a sweep at VIR when they moved up to the pro class for he and Kenton Cook story that was. Big thanks to Ziad Gondor who had a commitment, couldn't be there at VIR, supported the team in putting Kenton Cook in the car. They had a weekend to remember with a couple of wins in the pro class. For Hagen, running down Jan Halen right now, not for class position, but he needs to get through these two pro class cars if he's going to get to the next car in Pro-Am, which is Colin Brown up in third overall. 
Good middle sector for Balzan, about seven tenths quicker than Oberlin through sector two. So I don't think Oberlin's going to uh, take anything out of that gap this go around. And they were pretty close in sector one. Bill, though, just turned in a purple sector three. Well, that made up for a poor middle sector, yeah. so he lost a tenth of a second on the lap, but there was a huge three quarters of a second that he lost in the middle sector alone. So this pace in that BMW probably factors in that Bill is pushing and uh, probably had a little minor moment. Verhagen also pushing. He has caught the Belgian ace, Jan Halen and now runs right there in the slipstream. This is where the BMW is at its best. This is the car that has set the fastest top speed of the race, and here comes Neil Verhagen, pulls out a line, down the Moraine sweep to turn number five, and he grabs that position away. Fifth overall now belongs to ST Racing. Yeah, and Halen didn't even waste any energy in terms of trying to protect that one. He just knows he's a bit of a sitting duck right now with the BMW's pace on the straightaway in comparison to that new version of the Porsche. Another Porsche out the windshield now for Neil Verhagen. That's his next target, Stephen McAleer. Colin Brown, and we talk about Orbland's performance. <laughs> Colin Brown's hanging tough. He leads Pro-Am, so it's not that important for him to uh, showcase any more speed than he's uh, already uh, had so far in this race. But he'll know that Verhagen is not that far away, so he can't really rest too easy. Verhagen only, what, three and a half seconds back, so Brown's uh, going to keep pushing here, and if he gets to the tail of Orblin, he's going to keep pushing for that track position, potentially. Quite a redemption drive for Bill here today after having the off in Q2. Well, he was purple on the uh, third sector last go-around. He just went purple on the first sector this go-around and a decent middle sector, so it was a 5.5 second gap to the front last go around. Let's see if he squeezes that down any. Balls on already up this big hill here on the front straightaway. Checks in at a 205.5. Oberlin nearly a second quicker with a 204.6. It's down to 4.7 seconds now. Yeah, this is getting real. Colin Brown set the crowd strike fastest lap of the race that time. A 204.6 sitting there in the slipstream behind that big BMW M4 seems to be helping tow the Mercedes around. Yeah, and we saw this with George Kurtz in the initial phase of this race that the 0.4 car seems to get stronger the longer the race goes on. Burns off a little bit of that fuel, car comes alive. Bill Riley and that group just so sharp in terms of finding the sweet spot of one of these Mercedes. They've been campaigning that for so many years now even when you come to a nude circuit in terms of the race surface here. They did some testing, found the sweet spot. We're waiting for everyone else to really catch them up throughout the course of practice here, but... Portions of sector one include two long straightaways. No surprise to see the BMW featured there. And look, BMW's top of the charts in sector three as well, which encompasses the first half of the front straightaway. Not a purple sector in terms of fastest overall, but Auburn just uh, cut three tenths of a second out of the lead of uh, Balzan in sector one, but then gives it all back again in sector two. So sector two is where the BMW is struggling. It's really strong in sector one and sector three, however. Yeah, no BMWs in the top five in terms of best laps, best sector two times set. Yeah, so it's through that middle sector where there's a few more corners and braking zones that uh, Balzan is strong in the Ferrari and the BMW is strong on the top speeds. Still plenty of time here for America's BMW ace, Bill Oberlin. Bill gets kind of, you see him locked in with his steering. He's super smooth. You see other drivers working the wheel. He just kind of locks it in and just carves the corner. I think he uses his right foot to control if the car's doing anything uh, that he doesn't like versus more less um, less steering input for Auburn versus other drivers. Didn't make any headway though on that lap. Pretty much equal to balls on. In fact, gave up a few hundredths of a second. It's still 4.7 seconds, first to second. Colin Brown, the car we're looking at here, leads in Pro-Am. Running third overall. His closest competitor in class is Verhagen, who's about 10 seconds behind him, fifth overall. Right there in the background, working on McAleer, in fact, trying to 
eliminate any buffer between himself and the next car in class. Here comes Verhagen down the inside and McAleer gives way. I think for McAleer, they're really thinking about where is Mario Farnbacher in terms of their position. So right now, McAleer and uh, Phil Garris are on for a podium run. Farnbacher top five, so that would be a nice little points delta to build on the lead they have, which currently sits at 16 points. to the carousel one more time. Here comes the leader, Balzai, to the kink. Using up all the curbing there on exit. Oberlin starting to close in on Alessandro Balzan, whose teammate Manny Franco is standing by with DJ. Manny Franco here. Manny, you put the car exactly where you needed to do in qualifying, and you kept it going. How's it feeling out there? Uh, so far, so good. You know, uh, it would have been nice to have some more green flag racing, kind of build that little safety net a bit but uh i mean so long as they're first you're first right so can't really complain too much um the car was great uh obviously our our uh, pit stop went really well can't ask for more and uh yeah it's just uh, been a good day so far uh still first so we're, we're hopefully gonna stay that way um I'm just excited to see how it all ends. So. Well, I'll tell you what, we're pretty excited as well. Seems a little bit hot out there. I mean, condition in the car, is it playing into anything? Oh, I mean, it's, it's, you're always baking inside the car, you know, and uh, you kind of get used to it, your mind. Uh, it's distracted by other things when you're in the car, so you're definitely not really thinking about it unless it's, you know, unless it's to the point where it's just so hot. Yeah. You don't really think about it, so it's not really bothering me too much. So. Well, good. There you go. Manny Franco up in the lead is Conquest Racing. They're going to hope to hold on to it. Nothing seems to be bothering Alessandro no. Balzan at the moment. He just uncorked that car's best lap of the race at 2.04.9. About a tenth quicker than Oberlin, so it's back up to nearly five seconds, first to second. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit disheartening for Bill to uh, see that gap basically plateau a little bit. But once again, takes a couple of tenths out of the lead of the Ferrari in sector one. This middle sector that we're in right now is where the Ferrari really shines. Through the carousel as well, I think, is where the downforce of the Ferrari will uh, come into play versus the BMW. I do think Manny brought up a great point, though. That pit stop, the execution yeah. from Conquest was tremendous, and that pretty much accounts for the lead that they have right now. Yeah, I don't have the data on that, unfortunately, but um, I do feel they got an advantage there on the pit stop, certainly cut the margin a little bit tighter than everyone else and extended their gap. Alan Brown doing a nice job to stick with Bill Oberlin. He continues to lead in Pro-Am. The question, though, is how much is Neil Verhagen closing in? Those two running similar lap times the last time by a slight edge to Colin Brown. I'll keep pushing because Verhagen's uh, cut it to under five seconds, the gap between uh, the Pro-Am leader, Colin Brown, and uh, the BMW given chase. Norblin has just given up too much time in that middle sector to really be a factor here in closing in on the leader right now. So somewhere there through a sequence of corners, the BMW is not really in its sweet spot. Comes back strong in sector three. Colin Brown continues to push. Halzon pulled away a little more on that lap. Found another four tenths. It's up to 5.4. Here's Sellers serving his drive through penalty. I was about to mention we had a battle starting to break out, but I did not think we had seen this car serve its penalty. And now DXDT calls Brian Sellers to the pit lane. And that long, slow drive. That's this feels like an oh. eternity. When you've been blasting around this race circuit and you have to come down pit lane. Uh, lose 40 seconds, that is uh, a real body blow. Especially for a team that is starting to find the pace, just needs to put together a clean weekend or two. This is looking good. This is looking to be a really great battle here. Mario Falbach has continued to push for the race's edge. Number 93, the red machine. He can see McAleer, the car and team that they're chasing in the pro championship just up ahead. He's split between McAleer by Jan Halen, so it's not going to be easy to, to get to him, but he's much, much closer now. Ground strike fastest lap of the race set earlier in this race by Colin Brown in this car. Third on the road, the leader in Pro-Am. This is the pole sitting car 
for tomorrow. Here is Orblin. Once again, three tenths quicker in sector one, but then gives it all back in sector two. And there's a real pattern to this in terms of where the two cars excel and the two drivers are most comfortable. Orblin loves to win. Winning as driver in North America at this level of competition over the years. And there is Super is... Mario. He has pushed. You see that car twitching. Mario is digging. He wants to get to both of those Porsches. It'd be a huge day if they could leapfrog around Stephen Mackler here in their RS1 machine. Yeah, no question about it. What a great opening stint from Ashton Harrison, too. Didn't qualify the car terribly well, but she put her head down and was one of the big movers early in the race. And now Mario has wheeled in both McAleer and Halen. But what can he do with them? Catching is one thing, as we often say, but making the pass, that's a different equation. Well, Jan Halen is feisty, so much experience, but McAleer has really come on strong the last couple of seasons. Had a breakout season last year, obviously winning the Pirelli GT4 championship, nearly won another GT3 championship here in North America at the same time. And he's just got brilliant racecraft. The Scotsman is just excels in these type of racing situations. Three of the very best in GT racing here stateside lined up. Nose to tail, and it's pretty cool too, just how international this is. You've got McAleer from Scotland, Halen from Belgium, Farnbacher from Germany, all coming stateside to pursue a racing dream and carving out really impressive careers at different stages in their careers, it must be said, but these are three you have to contend with every weekend. Farnbacher is uh, just a driver that HPD on the performance development just absolutely love what you can do behind the wheel of one of these uh, NSX GT3 machines. There he is using every possible inch of the road there through the kink to try and close that gap down on both of these Porsches. Not so much concern uh, with a man immediately in front of him, even though that is for points. They're all pro runners there together, but he has to get to the championship leader. He cut into that gap with the championship winding down was Ashton Harrison watching on from the Racer's Edge pit stand. Talk about it a lot, but this is a smaller team. They do a lot with a little. I don't know many teams that have their PR rep as part of their over-the-wall pit crew, but... <laughs> and they're celebrating 30 years for HPD as well. That's a lot of nice tributes here this weekend. Decals on the car came out with a commemorative poster. It's a really cool poster, I have to say. I got a handful of them didn't share no five years the team has now been uh, working with uh, HPD and with this Acura chassis and they've really been brought into the Honda fold here in recent years it started off purely as a customer relationship but now they're the team that runs the HPD Academy they are tightly linked with Honda just here in the States but overseas here we here go he's Martin having a Locker. look Halen takes it in super deep, gets to the apex, keeps it under control. Right on the edge, both of these drivers, fantastic. Just a few moments ago, back in 10th overall, Valentin Hasekloh just reset the crowd strike fastest wow. lap of the race at a 2.04.6, halfway through the stint. That is impressive. That is super impressive. Question of what might have been without losing that track time earlier this weekend. Competitive overtakes, it's still all about that 38 car. For Hagen and Samantha Tan, they have been moving forward all race long. Same story for the 53 from MDK. Remember, Seth Lucas had his off, and now he has to recover fairly well to get inside the top 10 overall. Now ninth in the standings. Passed a lot of cars in doing so. McAleer just doing what he needs to do, not cracking. He can see them there. He knows the big picture. He can see that bright red Acura just a couple of spots back as we now see VHC doing his thing. First visit here to Road America and just set the fastest lap quicker than a lot of more experienced drivers at this circuit.
down the order. He's got about 25 seconds to find to get up to Estep in ninth overall. But logging laps, and I can't wait to see what he can do in the start of the race tomorrow. All the pros start race number two. He has been a revelation this season. Not well known on this side of the pond until now. Lincoln Bowling, great to see him back in our paddock. Sharing this car that uh, Corey Lewis is taking down right now. Car with Carl Washington. Brand new machine. Exciting times for GMG. I have a lot going on. Unfortunately for James Sofronis, he had an incident in GTA practice there a couple of days ago and uh, re injured his back. So I'm not sure we're going to see him in action anymore this season, unfortunately. So get well, James. I know he knows staying around and going to support his customers for the rest of the weekend. I have it on good authority. He was already on the phone with the series before it had even been released from the hospital, <laughs> trying to make sure everything was all taken care of with his team. He is a team first team owner. He's a racing driver second at this stage in his career. And what they do looking after their clients is second to none. Accolade using that fresh air on the front end of that Porsche to great effect here, carving through the carousel. Parker's uh, falling away slightly from Jan Halen. Much between these three. They are no. matching each other 10th for 10th just about every lap. A little bobble from Jan a couple laps ago gave Mario a chance to maybe look to attack, and that's about as close as anyone has been. That's John Meraki in the foreground with the smile on his face. He's the team owner, heads up this little race team from Florida and has won so many championships over the last few years. Boy, Mario lets it ride all the way to the edge of the curbing there. Yeah, he's just... Uh ring in its neck, so to speak, just trying to grab every thousandth of a second on every single corner. It's a long lap here. If you can pull it all together, it does make a difference, but you've got to be up on the wheel and have the confidence to do it. I think they're getting closer to McAleer here. McAleer's going to probably need to start to get a little bit defensive with his lines, and that could be good news for Farnbacher because that will slow both Porsches in front of him. So if, he, if Jan Halen get closer, that could really help out Farnbacher create some opportunity. He's got a big draft here. Sitting there in the slipstream. You can barely see it behind the Porsche 911. Here comes Gets Mario Farnbacher pulling to the inside. Halen's got the benefit of the draft. Is that enough to keep him level with Farnbacher? It is not. The German star is through. That's up another position to the sixth spot overall and fourth in class. Beautiful control there again through the apex of turn five. He's on the wrong side of the road, the dirty part of the track, shallow angle of approach to turn five, but still kept the apex. So that was points. And this is the points he wants. It's a two for right. You're going to gain points and you're going to take points away from the championship leader if he can get by the 28. Absolutely. Plus, it also means a chance to celebrate on the Road America podium if he can make this pass. This is for third. McAleer for RS1. Farnbacher for Racer's Edge. Couple of teams based in Florida. Oh, they're really playing chicken through the kink. You can hear kind of the throttle moving just that slight bit to try and keep the car underneath you. Yeah, get through there as quickly as you can. But Mario loses a little bit through the carousel compared to the Porsche, but then is able to make it back up again. Well, the notes while we've been watching this battle, Oberlin had closed it a little bit. Now Balzon answers with his personal best lap. The gap is four seconds first to second. Neil Verhagen has set and reset the crowd strike fastest lap of the race in successive laps. Yeah. He's now to within three seconds of Colin Brown for the Pro-Am lead, third and fourth overall. Here comes Farnbach, a big toe. McLeod has to defend. Now he's going to just try and time this, just try and crack the throttle a little bit quicker than the Porsche. And Acura looks to carve the corner really nicely. McAleer guards the inside. Farnbacher stays in line. This is where he made the move on the last lap to get by Jan Halen. Can he repeat it here? There's Eric Filgaris and the RS1 team. They watch on. Very interested spectators. Can McAleer fight back? Farnbacher blocks.
blitzing around the outside. There's the Racers Edge team, and they've got plenty to celebrate as Farnbacher has driven around the championship leader and up into third. Awesome stuff. They are pumped. Oh, McAleer's not done. He gets out wide. That might leave him vulnerable. And here comes Halen smelling blood in the water. He does. Side by Look side at the gap that seven. suddenly Mario's got. He's taken off from the two portions of that little slip by McAleer. Was there a touch there potentially? Oh, it was tight. Haywood looking to cross over McAleer on the run into the carousel. McAleer will not concede the inside line. In the meantime, Farnbacher has sprinted off into the distance. But Hagen has got the bit between his teeth. He is chasing down Colin Brown for that Pro-Am lead. Under 15 minutes to go, and it's getting spicy at the front. Up here in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, America's National Park of Speed, Road America. Balzon leads Oberlin. Brown leading for Hagen in the Pro-Am class, and both of those battles starting to close in in this final stanza. Bacher would love for Jan Halen to get around the other Porsche and uh, create more of a points gap. Oh, man, the ante just getting put pushed up and up and up as Colin Brown turns in wow. the fastest lap of the race. A 2.04.2 to get another couple tenths of breathing room over Verhagen. Balzan just sets his fastest lap of the race with the lead and gaps Orblin by another tenth of a second. It's 4.2 seconds at the front right now. Nip and tuck between these feisty competitors. Is the car that has made up the most ground in this race. Samantha Tan, Neil Verhagen charging forward. There's Samantha, big smile on her face. She loves what she's seeing here from her young teammate. Now the podium potential. He had a bit more time, who knows? Still 13 minutes to go. This is anything but over right now. Coming off of their best weekend of the year, two second place finishes in class at VIR. Chance to make it three runner-ups in a row if Neil Verhagen can run down Colin Brown. But as they stand, it would be a third consecutive podium. The only three that they've had all season. They would be in succession. The team has come alive here a little bit. They love the chemistry. Only 64 points out of the championship lead. It's a lot a lot of cars they would need to pass. Yeah, I think that's the problem, how far they're back in position as well as just to the leader. But you never know, you get momentum and uh, a lot of things can happen with positive energy towards the end of the championship season. George Kurtz looks on, seeing the progress of his teammate, Colin Brown, who's got the fastest lap of the race. Lead in Pro-Am, third overall on the road, still chasing Bill Orblin for all he's worth. Balls on with the 204-6 the last time by. Keeping an eye on this battle. Verhagen starting to close in on Brown. Let's hear from Neil's teammate, Samantha Tan with DJ. Down here on pit lane with Samantha. You guys are having one heck of a race out here today. Yeah, it's been really good. We've got the car set. Neil's doing great. <laughs> I mean, how close, how much are you able to push this thing at this point? Because it looks like that thing is on rails and it's doing whatever you need it to do. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we... Again, like I told you earlier, we were playing around with a tire strategy during qualifying, and I guess we put it all together for the race, and Neil's got a fresh set of tires, so he's just going at it. <laughs> well, he's going at it indeed, and he's making it look easy. They're trying to take the win here in Pro-Am. That is good insight there from Samantha. The teams don't have enough tires, essentially, to run stickers in every stint, so how you decide to use your allotment of scuffs can be one of the strategy cards at the team's disposal. Yeah, and I Reading into that scenario, I would imagine what they did was they used the same set of tires for Samantha and Neil to qualify on for race two tomorrow, and that gives them two fresh sets to work with in the race. So Samantha would have probably start on a fresh set, and then Neil had another fresh set to work with for the second phase. It's playing out pretty nicely for the team. For so long based in Montreal, now with the West Coast United States headquarters expanding into offering a customer racing program within Pirelli GT4 America, racing under the STR38 moniker. Plus a full European schedule this year too. They are a busy, busy crew. 
I can hear Neil's tires screaming <laughs> from, the, from the cameras that we've got around this race circuit. So he is pushing hard. He gained another couple tenths on the last lap. It's again back under three seconds as he puts the pressure on Brown. And part of the problem for Colin is he now might have a little aerodynamic interference, shall we say, from Bill Oberlin. That car might not be totally happy in some of the higher speed corners with the aero watch coming off the BMW. Yeah, that can certainly be a, have an effect, uh, particularly through corners like the carousel. I think you're spot on there, Ryan. And also, uh, Verhagen's got the incentive. He's getting ever closer. He can smell the exhaust fumes of that Mercedes right in front of him. Chopped off another three tenths. It's two and a half seconds. Meanwhile, up front, Balzan has been able, able to answer the challenge, and he's built that gap back to 5.3 seconds. What a special day this would be for Balzan, Conquest Racing, and especially Manny Franco. It would be his first win at this level, and he's from Milwaukee, which is just down the road. Imagine the celebration. If we didn't have to race tomorrow, right. it would be a special <laughs> one. Who knows what they can do tomorrow. Maybe they can uh, follow up. But still, this thing is not in the bag just yet. It's under 10 minutes to go. Balzano hasn't put a foot wrong. He's been under no real pressure in terms of someone sitting on his tail. But he's had the pressure from Orbelin in terms of knowing what that gap is and has been throughout the course of this race. But he's just been hitting his marks. Just total execution by so many of these front-running teams here today where Colin Brown may be picking up a little bit of an aero wash coming through that long duration corner there. The carousel is Chandler Hull watching on. You touched on it earlier, Calvin. This Conquest team was not happy when they rolled off the trucks for testing here earlier this week. And to go from effectively not quite knowing where to go with this because the setup they thought was going to be money just wasn't on to now controlling this race from pole quite a turnaround it really is and that just comes down to the experience on that team in terms of not panicking and uh, no one uh, finally learning their way with that new ferrari in terms of what knobs to twist to make it quicker they had a very successful test at indy talking to eric bachelor he said we showed up here and he said quite honestly the car was undrivable it was so loose meaning that the rear end was just uh, fighting the drivers just couldn't get any grip in the rear of the car and uh, they kept working on it balzan suddenly said yeah we've got balance in the car and i think once you got balance then the driver can start to lay a little bit more speed on top of what they've been doing previously and they found the pace suddenly Oberlin closed in a little on that lap it's 4.6 seconds now but more importantly Verhagen has the gap to Brown down to 2.2. He just turned that car's fastest lap of the race and chopped off nearly four tenths of a second. Yeah, it just went uh, purple in sector one on that previous lap, did Neil. So uh, he's got the bit between his teeth. For Colin Brown, they've been dominating here this weekend. He's just got to bring it home now. He's really got to knuckle down here for this last seven minutes or so find victory lane for this crash right by Riley Machine. That'd be three on the bounce for them as well, dating back to a sweep of the weekend at VIR. You look at what George Kurtz has done this year. I mean, it's been remarkable. He won in his class at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. He has this win streak going here in Fanatec GT World Challenge America, powered by AWS. He won earlier today in GT America with one of his best drives that we've seen out of him, certainly in the solo championship, passing Maymo Gidley to take the lead late in that race. I mean, how impressive is that? It was huge. Uh, you know, I'd love to chat to George about it. There had to be a real feather in his cap to uh, pass a veteran like Gidley. He looked at a stacked deck in GT America this year and uh, thought about how he's going to do. He's not in the fight for the championship this year. I haven't missed a uh, couple of rounds at Nashville recently, but nonetheless, that was a big win for him today. Just over six minutes to go. Alan Brown pushing for all he's worth because he knows Neil Verhagen is closing him down. Not sure there's much he can do, though, about Bill Oberlin out in front, and that will be holding him up a little bit at this stage. Balzon just ran a 2.051. Oberlin, though, uncorked a 2.046. Best lap of the race for the 94 car. He's not given up hope yet. The gap is now four seconds. And Verhagen now down to within two seconds of Colin Brown. First and second overall, they are your leaders. 
in the pro class. Third and fourth overall, run first and second in the pro-am class. And the four of them run within seven and a half seconds of one another. Here in the final five and a half minutes of race one in Road America. Look at Mahagan inching ever closer to Colin Brown. Now you got to wait that long to get back to Mario Farnbacher, but a strong recovery drive still from the Racers Edge team. Still a fight between the two portions. This has not gone anywhere. McAleer, though, for the moment, has the edge on Jan Halen. We ride on board with Halen now. Turn five, 50 miles an hour apex speed there. Climbing the hill. Through the gears, up to third. Mario Farnbacher would love to look in his rear view facing camera and see uh, this machine ahead of the 28 and give him a couple more points benefit in the championship. And you hear the little crack of the throttle, the whine of the drivetrain on that Porsche. Not much though. That no. is a fast quarter entry and this one is too here in the King. <laughs> those curbs. That's a treacherous part of the racetrack, as many have found out here this weekend. Jan Halen is one of the first drivers to test here with a pro-level car after the resurf, and he said, it's smooth, it's beautiful, but it doesn't have grip right now. And just gradually, over the weeks and the events that we've seen over the summer months, the track has rubbed in and uh, showcasing the speed that it has now. Yeah, this place has been busy over the last month, month and a half. You talk about some of the amateur level races that have been here, other sports car racing series, NASCAR Xfinity was here a few weeks ago. Auburn keeps cutting in. A couple of laps now, that last lap was six tenths quicker than Balzan, I think the lap before that was seven tenths quicker. So that's giving him hope, but time is not on his side. Maybe Balzan is just managing this gap and not pushing things too much. Realizing that he can afford to give up maybe another half second a lap and get it to the flag at this lap one more most likely this would be a huge breakthrough for this group it's been a long time coming at this level for eric bachelard he's had some success running gt4 wobbling they're deep wow that looked like he went a little bit shallow there recognized he may have missed his break point a little bit but he kept it together just looked like a slightly different of attack in a turn eight there, it may have just been the camera angle, but I thought he might have been in trouble momentarily. Stopwatch will tell the tale as Bill clocks in there in sector two, and he did, he gave up quite a bit of time to balls on. For Hagen, fastest first sector, he's continuing to push. He hasn't given up hope in catching that Mercedes there of Colin Brown, but I think it's too much work to do with not enough time to do it. Expecting the white flag this time around. Turning laps in the 204s, 205s. We're about to that point on the clock on the top left of the screen. Couldn't have managed it any better in terms of the clock as well. Nope. Balls on, we'll see the white flag wave from the starter stand. One more lap, four miles, 14 turns around Road America. That's all that separates Balls on and Franco from their first win of the 2023 season. Oberlin and Brown, that continues to be close the for Hagen. Hagen. new fast Hagen. lap. Oh my goodness, how impressive has he been? Just not enough time. You can see him closing this duo in though. We forecast this, Ryan, with these Pirellis, as the fuel load goes away, the car gets lighter and the pace is still there. We're not seeing the de deck that we've seen in years previously with this new racing service. Yeah, he was the fastest car on the track by multiple tenths that time. Neil Verhagen pushing for all he's worth, currently in the runner-up spot in the Pro-Am ranks. Looking to do one better, chasing Colin Brown. Pole sitter for race two tomorrow. Also at stake for Conquest Racing and Ferrari, this would be the first North American win for the Ferrari 296 GT3. It's not necessarily had the easiest of gestation periods, but 
It's shown some strength at times, and right now, Alessandro Balzon out in front, absolutely flexing his muscle. Has a three and a half second lead here on the final lap, but the man on the move has been Neil Verhagen. Crowd strike fastest lap of the race, sitting in fourth, pushing for all he's worth, trying to run down the class leader, Colin Brown. Give work the wheel there through the kink. Extracting every ounce of speed out of that car, but what a beautiful job by the whole group, Conquest Racing, Manny Franco and Alessandro Balzan. Very measured drive here at the front. Manny Franco got it started this morning in qualifying where he ran to the pole position. He was flawless out in front, managed the starts and the restarts with a plum. Turned this car over after a rapid pit stop from the Conquest crew to Alessandro Balzan, and Alessandro finishes the job. Conquest Racing, Alessandro Balzan and Manny Franco scored their first win in Fanatec GT World Challenge America, powered by AWS. Bill Oberlin comes home in second for the Bimmer World team. Colin Brown holds on to win in the Pro-Am class, fending off the challenge from Neil Verhagen, who set the fastest lap of the race on the final lap to come within six-tenths of a second of the Pro-Am class winner. That was a fabulous race. Not so much position changes, but just the chess game with the times there at the end and the gaps. Mario Farnbacher secures the podium for Racer's Edge. He comes home fifth overall. McAleer did win out in that duel with Halen. And Trenton Estep in the eighth spot. This is the lone class, AM class car in the field here this weekend. A debut in the GT3 ranks for John Branham and Paul Keebler. They run 14th overall. It's been a quiet day for this pairing. And they'll be thrilled with what they learned here today. John Branham is pretty quick here on that last lap, in fact, set that car's best lap. Yeah, they keep pushing and learning, so uh, nice lap by John, and he's the real deal. We saw him have a great run at Sonoma earlier this season in GT4 competition. Longtime driver coach. He's done some stunt driving as well over the course of his career. Every once in a while, you see him pop into a fairly major race. Has some open-wheel routes back in the Star Mazda days, back in the mid-aughts. But this is definitely the most high-profile shot he has received, and really excited to see what he and this TR3 team could do. Up the hill comes John Branham. He and Paul Keebler by default to take the win in the AM class, 14th on the road. Oh, look at the celebration from Alessandro Balzan. I can't wait to hear from him. He's always a bundle of energy, but this has been a long-awaited win for this program. I mean, I say that, that's not really true. They broke onto the scene at Sebring last year and instantly were on the pace. It only feels long-awaited because they have been close to the win a couple of times already. Yeah, they had a couple of runner-up finishes early in the season, then just kind of went quiet, just couldn't really find the speed in this Ferrari. So this will be an emotional win when you've had such a drought and you really feel you've been putting in the effort, but the results haven't been there. You can't find the performance to suddenly break through like they have here. And again, just reflecting from a couple of days ago, they thought they were in similar shape in terms of not going to be competitive again this weekend and uh, just turn things around brilliantly. They had a really bad weekend at Circuit of the Americas in May, taken out of a race in the first race of the weekend there, damaged the car so badly they couldn't take part in race number two. Bounced back by finishing fourth in both races at VIR, had that long period of, of waiting since VIR until now. And finally a chance to get back out on the track and score what will be a popular win, I have to believe, here in this paddock. Conquest Racing gets it done. Courtesy of a tremendous pit stop and excellent stints from both Manny Franco and Alessandro Balzan. Neil Verhagen, what a performance for the second time we've seen him in this car. He is the real deal. Oh, you saw some of the best drivers in GT3, you know, putting it all on the line and just forcing it and finding more and more lap time out of these race cars. That was just brilliant to see them continue to push and uh, extricate extricate time out of these cars late in the going. Pirellis were brilliant here today. What a run for Alessandro. You can see the smile underneath that helmet.
for so long affiliated with Ferrari, of course. And so to take the first North American win for this new Ferrari 296 GT3, that will be a special accomplishment. Balzan takes the helmet, the balaclava off, the smile, and yeah, that's plain to see what a race win means, even for a veteran like him. Let's head down and hear from him now with DJ. Alessandro, talk about a run out there. There's the hug from the team. The first win in North America for the 296 model, the first win for the team this year. You've got to be riding so high. i super, super happy and proud, you know, this this car had, uh, have, has an incredible potential and uh, it's been a learning curve for all this season, but uh, thanks to Conquest Racing and Course Horizon, of course, uh, uh, Ferrari support that is here. Yeah, we really, we started to understand this incredible machine, you know, it's a new platform and uh, I have to say it was fun to drive today. So uh, many did an incredible job, as always. So he put the car on pole, gave me the car with a nice lead and uh, I, I, I really was pushing really 100%. I mean, the, the car behind me was was catching me for a one point, but I said I, I need to go 100% and uh, very happy with the balance of the car. Uh, I'm super happy and proud to be the first win for the 296 here in North America. Well, there you have it. The first win for the team, the first win for the 296, a very happy driver. Big smile there from Alessandro. Hope to hear from Manny at some point yet this weekend. The car just looks beautiful. And now we've seen all the potential that we've heard the teams talking about fully uncorked here this weekend. Yeah, the car's a real piece of art. I mean, it's so beautiful. They just wear it's put together. It's like a prototype in a GT machine. It's incredible. Let's hear from our Pro-Am winners now. All right, here they are, our Pro-Am winners, Colin Brown and George Kurtz. Guys, you had to fight for that one, but what a race, what a win. Yeah, it was great. You know, George did a great opening stint. Uh, these guys had good pit stops, crowd strike by other guys did. And yeah, man, great to pick up another win. Obviously, uh, it was tight there at the end. I don't know what happened on the pit stop. It seemed like a, a bit of a weird call from, from the exit. I mean, I feel like I was ahead of the 94 and we had to drop back and let everybody by. But um, I'm sure we'll understand that better at the end. But man, hats off to everybody. They did a great job. And yeah, nice to pick up another win. And George, this is starting to become your stomping ground at this point. Two wins on the day. No, it's been a great day, and uh, credit goes to the uh, to the Riley team and CrowdStrike, and obviously Colin did a great job. And you know, we just uh, really focused on uh, keeping our pace and um, putting ourselves in a position to win. And we're happy, and we'll see what happens tomorrow. We'll see, indeed. Your winners here in the Pro-Am CrowdStrike by Riley. Continuing their strong run of form, what a remarkable stretch they're on in that car. We know how quick it is based on qualifying this morning. They're going to be a factor starting on the overall pole tomorrow. Yeah, for sure. And with, uh, with that victory, gives them the championship lead tonight with the problems for the championship leaders coming in. The 120 car, Adelson obviously having his off early in the going. Great fights up and down the field. Great job by the Conquest team to get that long-awaited win and then to keep the momentum going despite the long break for Crown Strike by Riley, bringing it home in the win position in Pro-Am. Here are your provisional race results. Balzan and Franco for Conquest Racing get the job done here today. Bill Oberlin and Chandler Hull for Bimmer World gave them a strong run there towards the end. Couldn't quite reel them in. Brown and Kurtz for Hagen and Tan for ST Racing. Really curious with what tomorrow holds for that squad after a fourth overall result today. Farnbacher and Harrison, great recovery to get up on the podium in the pro class for Racer's Edge. Yeah, it was, and with that, they cut into that 16-point lead that the 28 car had coming into this race weekend. Lost in the shuffle. How about the final podium position in Pro-Am to TRG? Derek DeBoer, Valentin Hasaklo on his first run here at Road America. Get it done. Third place in that class, ninth overall, and VHC starts the race for TRG tomorrow. Yeah, and that's big in the championship as well because Derek uh, hasn't partnered with uh, VHC all season. He sits there third, 33 points out of the league coming in. So that'll cut into the gaps of the 120 as well. Looking exclusively here at the Pro-Am results, as mentioned, TRG there in the third spot. Despite the drive through Smithson and Sellers still come home with fourth. That's a good result given the way their season has gone. Yeah, I think they're gradually uh, finding things and find their way there with those Mercedes and uh, inching up closer to the competition. Second best finish of the season for the 08 team. Highlights from race number one. It all got started with Manny Franco on the pole position in that Conquest Ferrari, and he pulled away early on in the going. 
Good battles, though, further back as Anthony Bartone got swept to the inside. Then we had this moment there. Will Hardeman hard into the wall. That car, unfortunately, was done. That leads to this restart. Phil Garris starts to go on the attack. Kurtz fighting there as well with Adam Adelson. It was a good start to the day for Adelson, but it ended early. Yeah, a little slip up there coming through turn seven. Heavy impact there. He's out of the competition. And a big point swing as well in Pro-Am. And Lucas trying to recover from it off early in the race. They had a long day at MDK Motorsports. This was dictated, this move here. There was an overlap in the pit stop exchange. And then Orblin on the attack gets to the inside here of Stephen McAleer. Phenomenal duel between these two. It actually started a couple of corners earlier than that. Ultimately, Oberlin comes out ahead in that scrap, but coming out ahead overall, Conquest Racing, Manny Franco's first ever GT3 win, paired with Alessandro Balzan. Big victory for the Indianapolis base team that runs that Ferrari platform. And as we've mentioned, first North American win for the Ferrari 296 GT3. First of many, I suspect, as that car has started to find its form. Big thanks, of course, to the Conquest team who are unlocking a lot of that potential over the course of this season. Getting ready for our podium celebrations. Everyone swapping war stories back behind the podium. Sometimes I think that's half the fun of going motor racing is meeting up with your buddies, telling them what happened when the race is done. Derek DeBoer celebrating with VHC. Valentin Hasseklo. Those two have formed quite the pairing. Ross Gunn started the season for TRG alongside Derek. We knew he wasn't going to be available for the whole season. VHC jetted in and joined them for NOLA. Tell you what, he has secured a spot with that team. He has fit in just perfectly with that California-based operation. Taking a look there on the right of the screen, that's Ashton Harrison. She was in the wars early in this race. Turned the car over to Mario Farnbacher, who got it done in his stint. He did a great job fighting his way forward through some pretty solid opposition. Some of the top GT drivers in the series, and Mario was able to come out on top in a few different duels to secure a podium result. And that team's first season back, racing in the top class of the championship. And then in the background, Bill Oberlin got the sunglasses sitting atop the hat. Another second place for them. He and Chandler Hull have found themselves in the runner-up spot with some regularity over the past season and a half. Only one win in these 90-minute race formats, but of course did win out of the American contenders in the Indy 8 Hour last year. Finally broke through for the first 90-minute sprint race win at NOLA Race 2 earlier this season. Pro-Am Podium, as our buddy DJ calls them to the stage. There is Neil Verhagen joining Samantha Tan. Three consecutive second-place finishes since Neil joined the team. They had not been on the podium all season before that, but now they've got that form coursing through their veins. They're looking very strong here at this stage. Taking another podium finish. But everyone chasing George Kurtz and Colin Brown. This has been the tandem to beat here since the start of the 2023 season. They celebrate, Calvin, another class win. And uh, for the 120 team of Adelson and Skia, not the weekend they were looking for coming here at Road America. Yeah, that's a great point, and we don't know the status of that car because it was a pretty heavy impact. We do know they have a second chassis here this weekend. It's the newer 992 variety that Adam raced earlier today in GT America. But assuming Adam is cleared, and we do think that will be the case based on uh, his body language getting out of the car, if they can't get the original repaired, at least they do have that to fall back on, but certainly taking a big hit in the points to not score and then to see the crowd strike by Riley guys have the result that they did. It's like Neil stole your sunglasses, mate. <laughs> you think I could pull those off? Yeah, I think you could. Hmm. I'm not so sure myself. I'll leave them to Neil. <laughs> sunglasses are safe on your head. Like Audrey make the decision. Yeah, I think I know where she's going to fall <laughs> on that one. Congratulations to the Pro-Am class podium. 
And for the Pro-Am cars to be mixing it up in the top five, we've seen it all year long. Well, they're so capable. evenly matched, the two right. classes, in terms of the driver lineups and how it shakes out. So I'd love to see them all together. It'd be fun. Part of the reason, by the way, if you're new to Fanatec GT World Challenge America, powered by AWS, the Pro Class here does mandate a silver as part of the driver lineup. Most places, it's pretty wide open as far as driver ratings are concerned in the Pro Class. So the delta between a silver and a bronze, not quite as big, and that's the difference between Pro and Pro-Am here stateside. That's the Racer's Edge duo. Harrison on the left, Farnbacher on the right. We joined on the Road America podium by Chandler Hall and Bill Oberlin. That was a car to watch throughout this race. Chandler Hall in particular had a very busy stint. He did, did a really nice job, set the table there. The real gap was established here by this Conquest racing team. That pit stop was excellent. Had to be right on the money there to create the gap that they did. Yeah, totally agree. It wasn't that big of a gap coming into the pits. And when they left, Balzon had a sizable advantage. We've lost Manny. We've got Eric Bachelard up there subbing for Manny Franco. First win and no Manny on the podium. Maybe already off celebrating at Seepkins. Off at Seepkins, yeah. That's right. We know where to find you, man. at the Tiki Hut. Eric Bachelard will celebrate a well-earned victory, first in the young career of Manny Franco, yet another on the sterling resume of Alessandro Balzan, and Conquest Racing continues to be a, a stout team in GT Racing here in North America. Great race in race number one of the weekend here at Road America. Race number two coming up tomorrow and from America's National Park of Speed.